Okay, so welcome back. I wish we were in a room together. I would really like to know how many of you thought we could make predictions about evolution and how many of you thought that we couldn't. In past years, the majority of people usually think that we can make predictions, but there's always a few that think that you can't. So what I want to try to do is convince you that we can. And so to do that, let's do a thought experiment. Again, you don't get very many good pictures of plants, so we're going to use an animal picture again. But here are the top 100 breeds of dogs that I found on this website. You can see that you know humans have been able to unpack the genetic variation of the wild ancestor of uh, domestic dogs into a huge diversity of forms. You know, you can get these little toy breeds that are this big. Um, you can get uh, much larger breeds. I don't. Well, so here's a um, Great Dane and a Chihuahua, right? We get very different morphs, right? So let's uh, ask a question here. So we've got an observation, there's a lot of different kinds of dogs. There's a lot of genetic variation that was inside uh, of the species we know as, as dogs. Um, so what happens if we, let's take a random sample of all of these dog breeds and let's let them loose in Northern Canada, up here on these islands, let's say. What sorts of adaptations would you expect dogs to evolve if we just let them all loose in Canada? Again, if we were in a room together, I would ask you to give me answers. Um, but in the past, most people suggest that maybe these little guys are just going to be uh, polar bear food. Maybe these big guys are a little bit too big. Maybe it would be useful for these dogs to have longer fur. Maybe it would be useful for these guys to blend in a little bit with the landscape a bit better. So maybe we wouldn't want crazy spots or dark colors right, in a place that's full of a lot of snow. In fact, this experiment's already been done, right? We have gray wolves in this part of Canada. And so you get these more medium-sized dogs with very long fur that have coloration that allows them to kind of blend in with both the snow and the vegetation. And so we could, you can could do that experiment and that's what's gonna happen. We could also ask the question of what if we did this in Australia? What if we went to Australia and we released a random sample of all these dog breeds with all of their alleles and their variation? And we could ask the question, well, what adaptations would you expect to evolve if we did this? And just to give you a sense of what the Australian landscape looks like, is big parts of it are full of this crazy red soil. Um, it's actually a really beautiful, beautiful place. It turns out this experiment's actually already been done. This is what dingoes are, right? So dingoes don't belong in Australia. They, they were brought there by people. And they're basically just dogs that were let loose and evolved into this reddish, wolf-like creature. You can see that they have maybe slightly shorter fur, they have maybe bigger ears than, than wolves, but they've, again, they've, they've evolved to match the, the landscape. So what's neat is that evolution is actually quite predictable despite the random genetic elements because it's not random who survives and reproduce, right? The mutations are random, drift can be random, gene flow can be random, but those individuals who survive and have the most babies are absolutely not random. Natural selection is not random. We can drill in a bit closer to, to wolf ecotypes, right? So you learned about Arabidopsis ecotypes in Mike's part of the class. We can look at wolf ecotypes, right? So here are all the different populations of wolves that are, that are distinct, the different ecotypes that we recognize. So it's Canis lupus, and then these are all the different subspecies that describe the different ecotypes. So if you look at the wolves that live in northern Greenland, you can see that they're primarily white. The ones that live in northern Alaska, also primarily white. Um, we can see that the ones that live a little bit further south, maybe these pink ones in the forest, they are a little bit more brown in color to match the, the color of the vegetation, and so on. And so again, the, it, evolution can produce these very different types. And there's probably quite a bit of gene flow, maybe not with these ones on the islands or in, in Greenland, but you can imagine there's certainly going to be gene flow between uh, these two populations. And so these are wolf ecotypes. Right, and then just to remind you of the boreal, or sorry, of the different biomes, right, you can see this is where wolves live. Here's the boreal forest down through here, Arctic tundra, which is very uh, different. And you can, Cascadia is also quite different, right? And so you can see that, that again, these, these different subspecies are evolving colors and sizes that adapt them to different parts of the landscape. Yep, so here are all the ones that live in tundra. You can see they're all slightly whitish. And here are all the ones that live in forest, and you can see that they're all slightly brownish. 